So uh, Wes, welcome. Um, I, I do have to say, it's great to see you again. Um, for most of you have read a little bit about him uh, on, the, on the screen there, but what you don't know is way back in 2007, 2008, when I was working for General Petraeus as his, his executive officer during the surge in, in the Iraq war, uh, Wes was an undergrad at Princeton and he wrote General Petraeus and uh, expressed an interest in counterinsurgency and what's going on in Iraq at the time he was in ROTC or was going to join ROTC to become a military officer. And General Petraeus actually invited him over to Iraq to see what was going on there. And that sparked uh, what has turned out to be uh, a lifelong interest in journalism. Um, and uh, besides his books uh, and his articles, he was a, a um, reporter or a correspondent for Politico for a few years uh, on the Pentagon beat. Um, but what he's going to talk to us to, about today is, uh, is his first uh, and really a critical book on the history of the Afghan war, The Hardest Place, the American military adrift in the Afghanistan's Pesh Valley. Now, we don't have a map for you, but the Pesh Valley is up in the northeastern corner of Afghanistan and the Nuristan province and the surrounding provinces there, and it is about as remote as you can get. Um, as I recall uh, from my time there in Afghanistan, uh, it, Alexander the Great actually swept through that province and left behind some DNA. There's actually people with blonde hair and blue eyes, uh, some of them to even today, um, but didn't stay there for long because it's not a very welcoming place to outsiders, which I, I think the American military discovered uh, over its time there. Uh, but I will turn it over to Wes to talk a little bit more about um, his background, and he'll uh, talk to us about 45 minutes or so about his book, and then uh, we'll open up to Q&A, and I'm sure he'll, he'll take Q&A on the broad array of questions on the Afghan war and where we go from here. So Wes, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Pete, and it's, it is a, it's a pleasure to see you and talk to you again. I think uh, I actually interviewed you when I was a freshman in college. I was like an 18-year-old reporter for the Daily Princetonian. I, I got you on the phone talking about uh, Field Manual 3-24, the counterinsurgency manual. Um, and then we you know, encountered each other late, later in, in Baghdad. So it was actually one of, during one of those early trips um, when I was you know, still in college and I was freelancing in the summers kind of between school years um, that I first went to the Pesh Valley uh, and got fascinated by the place. Um, you know, as, as Pete said, um, the Pesh is a place up in the northeastern part of Afghanistan. It kind of straddles uh, the, the provinces of Kunar and Nuristan. Um, it has some very famous tributaries that flow into it, like the Korangal, which has been depicted in documentaries uh, like Restrepo, the feature films like Lone Survivor, a variety of memoirs by, by soldiers who fought up in that area. Um, and you know, when I visited the Pesh in 2010, it was part of a, a trip about, about three or four months where I was embedding with different infantry battalions around the country, taking advantage of um, you know, what was then a pretty robust kind of embedding program that allowed journalists access to US troops on the front lines. Um, and I had been bouncing around just kind of visiting different units in different parts of the country. And I wound up in the Pesh not knowing a whole lot about it um, and became really fascinated by it for a few reasons. Um, one is it's an incredibly striking looking place um and you know it's 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 beautiful it's green it doesn't look like other parts of afghanistan um in part because uh it's one of the few parts of the country that has a real forest complex there um which presents a lot of difficulties for u.s forces that have operated up there um you know in 2010 before bin laden was killed um he was writing back and forth uh from his abadabad compound to some of his subordinates uh, giving advice about where um, Al Qaeda figures should seek refuge uh, when the CIA drone campaign became too intense for them in Waziristan. And he specifically singled out Kunar um, as a place where the mountains, but in particular the forests, would provide shelter from uh, aerial surveillance, airstrikes, and helicopter landings, which it really did. Um, and bin Laden was speaking from experience. Um, I, I didn't know that at the time when I first uh, visited in 2010 that bin Laden had actually set foot uh, up in that part of the country. Um, in fact, I didn't know much at all about how U.S. forces had wound up in that part of the country, because at that time, 
um, there were just there was a string of little outposts along the Pesh Valley floor. I mean, they looked like they looked they looked not that different from outposts that you'd see in out of photos and videos from from Vietnam, although very compact, um, small little fishbowl outposts on the valley floor. Um, and when I would visit these outposts, uh, soldiers wouldn't really be able to tell me why those outposts were there. I mean, they could tell me what their task and purpose that they were accomplishing at that time was. Um, but it was they wouldn't be able to say why or when the outposts had been built. And that's not a knock on the soldiers. It wasn't their job to know that. Um, but it was a symptom of how long um, at that point, which we now know was not even the halfway point of U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan, how long U.S. troops had been in this part of the country. Um, that basically, as units rotated through, the origins of U.S. involvement had been lost, the details of it anyway, um, had, had been lost to history already. Um, and it took me a really long time to kind of rewind that tape. Um, and it was part of what I, I set out to do before I knew that I was writing a book, um, was just try to figure out at each of these little dramatically cited, heavily contested outposts um, it, it, that exist, that still existed in 2010, what was the origin story? How had they first gotten there and why? Um, because at that point during the surge, um, US commanders had basically given up on Kunar and Nuristan. Um, they were pulling out of the area, uh, they were doubling down in, uh, in more heavily populated lowland parts of the country after essentially recognizing that um, their counterinsurgency approach had not taken. Um, it really just had not, it had not stuck in Kunar and Nuristan. Um, and it, you kind of the situation you would see there at the time was um, these little outposts, they had been built as uh, with the promise of being kind of bubbles of security. They would provide security for the population around them. And they had done that for a time, but over time, the war had come down from the mountains and they really had become bubbles of danger. They, they were endangering the population that lived around the outposts. Um, and there was such a, such a routine of, of, uh, of combat and heavy ordnance being expended on all sides between you know, artillery fire missions, airstrikes, the enemy firing recoilless rifles and barrages of RPGs down to these little outposts. Um, uh, that despite the, the massive amount of firepower being expended, um, it was almost a, it was a routine for both U.S. troops uh, and, and the Taliban up in the hills by that point in 2010. They had built up the outposts with huge concrete walls. Um, U.S. soldiers didn't go anywhere uh, for the most part outside of big MRAP armored vehicles. Uh, and for their part, the Taliban knew exactly how long it was going to take for uh, after they started a firefight, how long it was going to take for our mortar shells to start falling, for artillery to start falling, for JDAMs to start falling. So you kind of got the impression that um, really who was being hurt um, uh, up at, by, by 2010 in the Pesh Valley was neither the enemy nor the Americans, although of course they were taking casualties. It was the people who lived there who were stuck in the middle. Um, and, and so, you know, American troops who lived at these little fishbowl outposts could be forgiven for thinking, you know, only, only an idiot or a moron would have built an outpost in this place where we're so exposed to the enemy, they can see our every move. Uh, we have no element of surprise. Um, you know, completely observed at all times from the heights above us. Um, but of course, it wasn't, you know, it was not stupid people or people who wanted to put American troops uh, in danger that built these outposts. They were built in different times and contexts when there wasn't fighting there. Uh, in some cases, as lily pads for manhunts much deeper uh, in the mountains in Afghanistan, in some cases, as fire support bases for nearby valleys where there was very intense fighting. And so that was the story that I kind of set out uh, to try to solve was how did these outposts get there? Um, and I organized the book into four parts um, that describe exactly that, just the chronology of US involvement uh, in the Pesh, um, how it began, how it proceeded, how it ended. So I think in, in the time that I, uh, I have here today, I'm just gonna walk through um, the major events of the book, describe how it's organized, describe the events as they occurred. Um, and then I'd love to take questions um, uh, you know, I think we have a, a good amount of time for questions, uh, both about the Pesh and, and about Afghanistan more broadly, although, you know, I, I may defer on some because, again, this book, uh, my knowledge really is um, much deeper about this one area than it is about the, the country more broadly. Um, but so when I alluded to bin Laden earlier, it turns out, as I found out after going and, you know, interviewing Delta Force officers and CIA officers who had been there at the very beginning, um, that US troops, they arrived in Kunar very early on in 2002. This is when they set up their first fire base at the mouth of the Pesh Valley near the city of Asadabad. Uh, and they set it up um, because they believed, 
correctly, we know in retrospect, that that's where bin Laden had gone after Tora Bora, not to the Pesh specifically, but to somewhere in the province of Qunar. Um, and we know in retrospect that they were right. Um, we know that uh, bin Laden uh, set up shop um, after escaping at Tora Bora in um, this very rugged valley called the Shigal, which is adjacent to the Pesh. It's a place where the Joint Special Operations Command, or JSOC, with its Rangers and SEAL Team 6 operators, uh, and then the CIA guys supporting them, um, were hunting very actively for bin Laden, um, working out of that Asadabad base that they set up in 2002 for a period of time um, before the war in Iraq essentially caused the JSOC task force to shrink, go down to skeleton manning, uh, and leave. Um, largely, you know, just largely leave the country for uh, for the war in Iraq, leaving behind just a, a small crew at Bagram that really was not equipped to to continue to to pursue the trail that they had lost at Tora Bora. Um, you know, one of the fascinating things that I learned is how close U.S. troops actually came in 2002. There was a big raid that's described in the first chapter of the book, um, done by SEALs and Rangers in the Chagall uh, around this time of year in 2002. Um, where they actually, they, they got the right place. They got to the place where bin Laden had been, but he had left there a couple of months earlier and had moved to another part of Kunar. And actually the, um, the, the Afghan warlord who was hosting him, a guy named Kashmir Khan, um, later described to, other, to, to an Afghan journalist, um, described how he was, he was still present at the scene of the raid, but managed to walk out of the cordon. Um, so that's kind of one of, the, um, you know, one of the loose ends that it's hard not to think about is, you know, what, if, what if the SEALs had caught Kashmir Khan and, uh, that raid in the in the fall of 2002. Could he have led them to bin Laden in the fall of 2002 when he was still on the Afghan side of the border? Uh, we'll never know, obviously, because uh, it wasn't until a year later uh, in 2003 that the Bush administration returned its focus to Afghanistan, um, told General McChrystal when he took command of JSOC that fall, um, you got to pick up bin Laden's trail. Um, and, and he and the CIA uh, launched a large operation up into, into Kunar and Nuristan, into the Pesh specifically, um, trying to figure out where bin Laden had gone to pick up the trail that had gone cold, not knowing that by that time he was already in Pakistan. He was already gone, uh, at least as far as the military was concerned. He was on the wrong side of the border. Um, th so this big operation in the fall of 2003, uh, which is documented in some you know, really incredible photos that Rangers took at the time up in the, it was called Operation Winter Strike, um, up, in these, up in these stark, beautiful valleys, the Perun Valley, the Kantiwa Valley, tributaries of the Pesh, um, it was a flop. R Rangers joked that it was Operation Winter Strikeout because they didn't find anything. Um, they didn't pick up Bin Laden's trail, nothing like that. Um, but two things did happen during the operation. Um, one was there was a, a really uh, horrific civilian casualty incident um, where the CIA um, requested a, an air, a military airstrike on a compound uh, in the Weigal Valley way up north of the Petch uh, and wound up killing um, not their intended target, who probably was not there, but um, the, the family members of a, a very prominent Nuristani cleric who was really not the person you wanted to make an enemy out of, uh, was someone you would have been much better to have on the, on the U.S.-backed government side. Um, and two, uh, an army ranger named Jay Blessing was killed uh, by an IED on the Pesh Road on November 14th, 2003, during Operation Winter Strike. He was the first American who was killed up in that part of the country in Kunar, first American killed in the Pesh Valley. Um, and a base was established during the operation just to facilitate the execution of the operation to support the rangers as they went to and fro into different valleys. But after the operation left, after the operation ended, the base stayed. It was named after Jay Blessing. It was named Camp Blessing or Forward Operating Base Blessing. And it became the hub of our, a decade's worth of counterinsurgency operations in the area as different military units all kind of rotated through and took their turn. And so part one of the book out of four parts is about that origin story. How did U.S. troops wind up in the Pesh Valley? And then it's about the first units that lived up there, which were small units. Um, in, back in 2003, 2004, 2005, it started as Green Beret A-teams. Um, the third chapter of the book is about a pair of Green Beret A-teams that lived in the valley in 2004, one after the other. Um, and it kind of introduces um, a concept that becomes very familiar over the course of the book, which is what happens when different units that look the same on paper, you know, one Green Beret A team and another Green Beret A team swap out with each other, replace each other, uh, and actually take very dramatically different approaches. Uh, and that's what happened in the Pesh in 2004 in the aftermath of Winter Strike. There was a National Guard Green Beret team um, from uh, 19th Special Forces Group out of Utah um, that was operating in one way, um, trying to do kind of what they thought of as classic counterinsurgency. They talked about the ink blot or the oil spot 
um, trying to make it spread, create a little bubble of government uh, government control, although there wasn't much of a government to speak of at that point. I mean, they, they were the government. Um, uh, and they kind of they they took kind of a minimalist approach. They didn't go into the side valleys where they were getting lots of uh, you know reports. Of, oh, this 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 militant is up in this side valley. Um, that militant is up in the other side valley um, because they exercised some skepticism. These Green Berets from the National Guard team about um, where these reports were coming from and why. And this goes back to what had happened the preceding fall in this airstrike that killed uh, killed a bunch of civilians um, on you know the day before Halloween in two thousand three. What really had happened was um, the CIA had been played by its informants um, into, uh, you know, as I as I report in the book, based on having gone and interviewed survivors um, of the strike, interviewed CIA officers involved, interviewed um, members of the, uh, you know, members of the family who went on to work in the government and kind of investigate it uh, for themselves. Um, it, it was a pretty common story back then for U U.S. intelligence officers um, and special operations forces. Um, to really be used as muscle by one side or another in local disputes. That's what had happened during this uh, this airstrike in 2003. It's what this Green Beret team that was there in the first half of 2004 was worried would happen. And it's the reason that they didn't kind of follow up on every tip and go go chasing ghosts in all the valleys surrounding them. And it's what this the next Green Beret team did fall prey to doing. Uh, a Green Beret team out of Fort Bragg, an active duty team, um, that had been in Afghanistan a couple times before and kind of discarded the, the National Guard team's advice. Um, and they very quickly became mired in um, going over and over on offensive missions into a side valley called the Korangal, the one that has become infamous in, in, in later years. Um, because essentially what was happening was they were, they were being used as muscle um, by uh, informants who were telling them, um, go up into the Korangal, there's enemy up there, because those informants had a stake in the timber trade. There was a, um, you know, I mentioned earlier the the forests that blanket the upper slopes of the mountains in Kunar and Nuristan. The Cor the Korangal became um, in the 1980s. It had become a hub for a very profitable trade in cedar, uh, the timber of cedar trees, um, to help fund the jihad. Um, and by in the 1990s, after the jihad against the Soviets had ended, uh, this timber trade had kind of taken on a life of its own. Um, the Korangalis uh, in the valley had become rich off of it. Um, so had kind of their middlemen uh, in the in the surrounding Kunar and Pesh valleys, um, who who would buy their timber and then sell it to uh, to merchants in Pakistan for for sale to the Gulf. Um, and so it was those middlemen in the in the in the low lying valleys, the Pesh and Kunar valleys, um, that U.S. forces kind of naturally found themselves allied with uh, when they came into Kunar in 2002, 2003, 2004. And it was those middlemen who sicked them on the Korangalis and said, hey, go up there. Um, you know, these people aren't paying their taxes. Uh, these people are violating the timber ban. Of course, the reality was that timber ban had been put in place um, because of kind of false assumptions um, that there was deforestation going on, assumptions that had been fed by these same middlemen in whose interest it was to get a timber ban in place um, so that they could criminalize uh, their rivals in the timber trade. So part one of the book ends with um, you have a situation where there's still a very small number of U.S. troops um, up in this part of the country, um, but they have uh, kind of the groundwork has been laid for what's to come. They have they've built an outpost um, and they've gotten sucked into this local dispute in the timber trade um, <clears throat> The you know, these these uh, lowland uh, timber middlemen have brought in uh, have brought in the U.S. military, involved them. Uh, and the Korangalis in response have brought in the Taliban who weren't there previously, really were not, um, you know, not part of this, not really part of the picture in the Pesh Valley before 2001. They hadn't really penetrated up there. I uh, had brought them in to counter the U.S. Um, and so you get, you get the, uh, you get, it becomes, the Korangal becomes this arena where the U.S. and the Taliban, both outside actors are duking it out and fighting each other. Um, and this leads to tragedy in 2005, on June 28th of 2005, um, a, a Chinook full of U.S. Special Operations troops is shot down over the Korangal during a, an ill-advised raid against a you know, fairly low-level insurgent who was up there. Um, and and 19, 19 soldiers and sailors are killed. It's Operation Red Wings, um, you know, sort of famous disaster that happened in the early stages of the war. Um, it, it, looking back on, you know, uh, on that event um, with the hindsight of all the Americans who've been killed since, 19 doesn't seem like that vast of a number. Um, but uh, up to that point, it was about 60 Americans had been killed in the whole war so far, 60 or 70 um, in, in Afghanistan. 
So the, the, the Operation Red Wings and the loss of those 19 special operators um, really kind of brought the military's attention back to this part of the country um, by raising the death toll in Afghanistan by a quarter in the space of an afternoon. Um, and it, it, it worked to, it militated toward pushing the military to kick things into a higher gear in the Pesh. And so in 2006, um, as, as the book describes in part two, um, what happens is the 10th Mountain Division comes in, conventional army comes in, um, and the infantry floods the place and starts building more outposts uh, and trying to apply this inkblot strategy on a broader scale. And not just one ink blot at the district center, but lots of little ink blots. Uh, and not just in the Pesh, but up in its very remote tributaries like the Korangal and the Weigal. And so part two of the book is about the succession of army infantry battalions that fought that fight. I think I know at least one uh, member of one of those battalions is in the audience today, um, former infantryman, now historian, um, who, fought, who, who fought up there with the 173rd Airborne's 2503 Infantry Battalion that was the, the second unit to inherit this task. And what you see happen uh, is just as there was kind of a, a mission creep between the two Green Beret teams that were there in 2004, there's a similar mission creep among the infantry battalions that fight in the Pesh over the years. They go there for 12 or 15 or 16 month stints. Um, the ball is in one place when they arrive, it's in another place by the time they leave. Um, the new unit comes in, um, it inherits kind of the situation at the end of the deployment. It doesn't really usually appreciate what the situation was at the beginning. A lot is lost in terms of why different things were done, why different decisions were made. Um, and the new unit is left to just keep on pushing forward. Um, and in some cases, what this results in is um, units kind of uh, continuing to bang their heads against a wall in places like the Korangal, where it probably was not ever feasible um, to, to do things like pave a road way up the back of the valley. But that's what U.S. units tried to do because it was, you know, what the unit before them had been trying to do. And it takes um, it takes really until in 2010, uh, until shortly before my first visit for the Pesh, uh, for the U.S. military to extract itself from the Korangal Valley. Um, and begin to pare down this, this presence that had become one of the most violent parts of the country, one of the toughest places for US uh, infantrymen to operate in the whole country. Um, in part because you know, what the military learns is that it's a lot harder to remove these outposts than it is to put them there. Um, you, you, you build these outposts um, in this incredible terrain, um, and then they grow, they accumulate people, they accumulate equipment, uh, and, and pretty soon, um, you know, disestablishing the outpost is not, not a matter of just picking up and driving away or flying away. It's a, it becomes a major logistical feat to remove one of these outposts. Uh, and not only a logistical feat, but it becomes kind of a, an emotional uh, and psychological and propaganda issue um, where you, you know, US deaths accumulate around these outposts. The outposts get named after soldiers who were killed near them. Um, the Taliban feature fighting uh, in these in these valleys in their propaganda videos, um, and generals higher in the chain of command become kind of loath to sign off on leaving these outposts for fear of kind of what it will look like when they hand a valley back to the Taliban, especially when it's a valley that wasn't occupied by the Taliban before 2001. Um, and it's this, this dilemma of kind of, well, okay, we know we don't want to be in this valley anymore. We, we, we're, not, we're not accomplishing the purpose that we were intended to serve here. Um, but we also don't want to hand it back to the Taliban. We don't want to just up and leave. Um, that leads to uh, the next big tragedy for US forces in the summer of 2008, um, a battle in the town of Want in the, in the Weigal Valley where nine paratroopers um, from 2503 infantry are killed um, basically in this game of musical outposts as um, Lieutenant Colonel Bill Ostland, who was the battalion commander at that time, he was trying to walk this line of, he wanted to close the more remote outposts deeper in the Weigal Valley, consolidate closer to the Pesh proper and fob blessing, but he didn't want to leave altogether. So he was trying to establish a new outpost uh, in a more supportable place um, partway up the Weigal Valley. Um, but it was the end of the deployment and the enemy took advantage of that. Uh, and slammed the outpost before it was really had been had been built up beyond just a just a, a skeletal construction of concertina wire and HESCO barriers. And it resulted in this tragedy that um, led to a big CENTCOM investigation. Um, careers were essentially ended over it. Um, uh, but what the CENTCOM investigation never really did was 
uh, look at the look at why this had happened. It, it looked at the days and weeks preceding the battle, but it didn't look at the years preceding the battle to kind of understand all the different factors that had been at play that had put 2503 infantry in the position where it felt that in order to not be in two even worse outposts, it was going to build a bad outpost, right? Um, uh, it, it, so it kind of it, it's that investigation and a lot of the articles um, about the Battle of Want, uh, they present this snapshot in time um, when there's really a much more complicated story. And, and that story continues um, in the third part of the book, um, which is as you know, the next sort of batch of battalions between 2010 and 2014 or so um, extricate themselves from the Pesh, first from the side valleys and then from the Pesh itself. Um, and what you see happen uh, as they do this is um, it's not done. It, it, it's it, they have to keep they have to keep doing it right. Um, U.S. units they pull out in 2011 from the Pesh, but they don't really coordinate with the Afghan government. The Afghan government actually has has interests and equities in the Pesh that it's unwilling to relinquish when the U.S. decides to leave. So the Afghan troops are left behind there in 2011 at a point when they're really not ready to be on left on their own. Um, they start to collapse. Things are going south. U.S. troops get sucked back into the Pesh, almost in a way that foreshadows what happens in Afghanistan more broadly when the Obama administration, um, you know, downsizes drastically the U.S. mission uh, in, in 2014, 2015, um, but then is forced, um, you know, the military then goes back in and reopens a lot of locations, brings force numbers back up uh, in 2016, 17, and 18. The same thing kind of happens a few years earlier in the Pesh. U.S. forces go back in um, in 2011, 2012, they take a kind of a mixed approach. Um, on the one hand, uh, in some cases, um, battalions just go back and keep doing the same thing they were doing before, just start up where they left off, do big air assaults up into the mountains, basically a, a tried and untrue um, tactic is kind of the way I, I think a lot of people would think of these big air assaults that rack up a body count, but don't produce any, any long-term result. Um, <clears throat> but in the end, they kind of settle on this smaller scale advisory approach that results in now that they understand the Afghan army isn't going to give up the patch, the Afghan army is there to stay. Um, uh, they, they do this, the smaller advisory war that uh, actually allows the Afghans to then hang on to the valley um, after U.S. forces leave for the second time in 2012 to 2013. They pull out again. Um, which was 2013 was the next time that I visited the Pesh to go and visit the ANA as the Americans were leaving to kind of report on the situation that they faced. Um, as they inherited the place. And that brings us to uh, part four of the book, um, which is about really the things that have happened since 2013 uh, up there, but with a focus, you know, less of a focus on the Afghan government side and what the Afghan forces were doing on the ground and more of a focus on uh, the continuing US presence, um, not on the ground, but in the air. Um, as the US shifts to a drone-based um, drone strike counterterrorism campaign, um, run by the same organizations, the CIA and JSOC, that had kicked off the war up in that part of the country. Um, because, you know, something that makes the Pesh uh, and the surrounding areas of Qudar and Nuristan kind of unique from many other parts of Afghanistan um, is that Al-Qaeda was there all along. Al-Qaeda never went away. Um, e even after the Taliban was unseated from power in 2001, 2002, there was a persistent presence for all these intervening years of Al-Qaeda operatives, uh, me you know, meaning both Afghans uh, who were part of Al-Qaeda, but also Egyptians, Saudis, Kuwaitis, um, for foreign fighters who were known by name to the intelligence community and to their to the countries, the, the intelligence agencies of the countries they came from, um, who were taking advantage of the mountains and the forests um, to maintain an Al-Qaeda presence in the country. Um, so kind of the irony is that U.S. forces uh, went up to Kunar in 2002 looking for an Al-Qaeda presence that they didn't really find because it was temporary, bin Laden left, um, they, they didn't get him. Um, but as U.S. forces stayed and the stakes grew uh, and the fighting became more intense, more and more genuine Al-Qaeda fighters were drawn in uh, to participate in this. Uh, and then the U.S. departure actually spurs um, an Al-Qaeda retrenchment um, in these same valleys that they're departing from because Al-Qaeda correctly calculates the United States is done with this place and is not going to commit ground troops again um, to these, these rugged valleys where it's been burned so many times and lost so many men. And this drives JSOC and the CIA to this drone, this drone strike solution, um, uh, which is what the final chapters of the book are about. Um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a solution that 
you know, they hone, they get, they get really good at it. They get good at killing the people they intend to kill. Um, but they pretty quickly run out of, you know, the people they intend to kill uh, and start casting a broader and wider net, going after lower and lower level militants um, in a way that, according to my interviews with um, people from these affected communities, um, uh, often uh, actually increased support for the militant groups, if not for Al-Qaeda, um, then for local groups like the Taliban uh, that were coming in and, and taking control of, uh, of the areas after the US left. Um, what this eventually leads to is there's a long manhunt by JSOC and the CIA for a particular Arab militant up there named Farouk al Qatani, who's sort of not very widely known um, uh, among scholars who study Al Qaeda from open source material, but he was a huge, uh, huge target of focus for the intelligence community um, in the later years of the Obama administration. They finally kill him in 2016. Um, and no sooner have they done that than uh, Basically, the Al Qaeda threat is replaced by the Islamic State, and which is where the book ends. Is really with the um, the appearance of the Islamic State uh, in, in Kunar, um, in, in the same old valleys where U.S. troops had been fighting. Um, so you wind up with you know Ranger and SEAL officers who had marched around up there in 2003 during winter strike. In 2013, 14, 15, 16, um, they're they're targeting Al Qaeda with drone strikes up there. Um, and in 2017, 18, 19, they're targeting the Islamic State with drone strikes up there. Um, and you know, the, the question uh, that you, ha you have to tackle when looking at the Islamic State in, in this part of the country is what does it mean for the Islamic State to be there? And this is the thing that um, was a, you know, was a real dilemma that um, uh, during the Trump years, the US military and intelligence community faced in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and that you know, I think now, um, the Biden administration faces in Afghanistan is kind of weighing the relative threats of the Taliban, Al Qaeda, the Islamic State, these three militant organizations that are all um, all operating up there in this part of the country. Um, the calculus that uh, the Afghan government reached um, it, during this period, when it still existed uh, in, in recent years, um, was that in that part of the country, the Islamic State was the bigger threat, and it actually collaborated with uh, the Taliban against the Islamic State, essentially leaving Al Qaeda uh, to its own devices, because Al -Qaeda, the remnants of Al Qaeda were embedded within the Taliban, um, who the Afghan government is collaborating with. Uh, and because the United States is supporting, the, is supporting the Afghan government, you actually wind up with this bizarre situation for a period of time before the Doha talks and you know, late, well, as the Doha talks are occurring in late 2019 and 2020, where throughout the country, um, U.S. air power is hammering the Taliban, trying to kind of bring the Taliban to the negotiating table, get the Taliban agree to better terms. But up in this one part of the country, U.S. air power is hammering ISIS, and uh, the U.S. is even using its traditional tools of signals intelligence and all that um, to figure out what Taliban units on the ground need in their fight against ISIS, figure out, for instance, okay, there's a certain machine gun nest that's going to give them trouble when they go up the mountain tomorrow morning, um, and strike that machine gun nest. Um, and so within the JSOC task force, the Rangers who were running it in late 2019, early 2020, um, they joked that um, the, the little organization within their task force um, that was called Team East that was responsible for these strikes, they jokingly called it the Taliban Air Force. And there was even a sign made to this effect. And that's kind of the strange, the strange situation that the US is left with in the, the waning years of its presence up in the northeastern part of the country um, is that it's outsourcing its counterterrorism um, mission uh, partly to the Afghan government, but also partly to the Taliban, even as the Taliban continues to act as host to another international terrorist organization, Al Qaeda, um, which it cannot be trusted to, you know, to take any type of action against. Um, and, you know, we see we see echoes of some of this in the events of the past six months and year as the Afghan government has collapsed. Um, and U U.S. forces have had to, in events that are not depicted in the book, obviously, um, have had to um, figure out how to deal with the Taliban in Kabul um, as they were leaving uh, and as they both faced the mutual threat of ISIS, you know, the group that killed 13 Americans at Kabul airport at the end of August. Um, but again, that's, you know, that's taking us beyond the scope of the book. The book ends with the Doha talks when in Kunar, we're already seeing at that point the post-American presence that, you know, we're going we're gonna to be seeing for years to come in the rest of the country now. Um, uh, I'll leave it there. I mean, I think I've, I'm a little short of the 45 minutes that I was allotted to um, 
you know, to, to, to break down the book and talk about it. Um, but I, I, I love to do the Q and A. So um, I think, you know, if, uh, if we could move to that, I, I, that'd be great. Well, <clears throat> thank you for that, Wes. And um, really fascinating stuff on a, a war that not many Americans really have paid close attention to. They only know some of the broader, broader pictures. Um, I have a few questions and then we'll go to our audience questions, which are starting to filter in. Please. Um, did you do research on the ground? Did you have, actually go to the Pesh Valley? Yeah, I did. I mean, that's how I first became interested in it was um, in 2010, I was um, uh, up there embedded with uh, a battalion of the 101st Airborne Division, the 1327 Infantry Battalion, the Bulldogs. Um, uh, and it just kind of living at their outposts, um, traveling around with them, going on patrols with them. I mean, that's what got me hooked on the place. And then I subsequently went back um, uh, to in, in bed with the Afghan National Army there, um, working with uh, an interpreter whom I had hired, um, who had been a US, uh, an interpreter for the US military up there previously, uh, who kind of unlocked access to um, district officials, ANA commanders, and so on, so that I could interview them and get their perspectives on, uh, you know, on the US military. Because in some sense, this is a book that's about the US Army more than it's about the war in Afghanistan. But I wanted to be able to portray the US Army as it was seen by the Afghans who were dealing with it, um, at least the, the Afghans who were, who were living around it and who were fighting alongside it. Um, you know, subsequent trips were mainly to Kabul um, as the security situation in Kunar deteriorated. Um, in 2017, for instance, I spent a chunk of time in Kabul, uh, wanted to get up to Kunar again, but the emergence of ISIS up there made it impossible, or probably not impossible, but made it risky enough that I was not willing to risk uh, not just my life, but the lives of others, an interpreter and driver and so on, um, to go up there when it turned out to be possible to get, um, you know, there was enough, there was enough flow of people between Taliban controlled areas of Kunar and Nuristan, they would give like 10 day passes to people to go do business in Kabul, um, that you could actually, you could do kind of big group interviews um, with uh, Kunari and Nuristani men um, in Kabul as they passed through and kind of do oral histories of their experience with the Americans. Um, and their experience with the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Uh, so that, that was kind of, that's the nature of the, the on the ground research. Um, but a lot more of the book is based on um, just interviews with American soldiers, American veterans who fought up there. I mean, I think I interviewed, it's like 400 plus American troops over the years about their experiences up there, as well as uh, I'm not, you know, as well as many Afghans. Um, and uh, documentary research also. I mean, there's lots of, there's tons of declassified FOIA stuff from big events like the Battle of Wanat. Um, uh, that allow you to kind of get, uh, you know, contemporaneous documentation. You know, I'm, I'm not a historian, so, you know, but I'm a journalist, but um, I, I tried to get as much uh, kind of, you know, real documents that depicted uh, records of what these infantry battalions were doing up there as I possibly could. Happy to take you into our program. Did you <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one of those infantrymen that you interviewed, well, first, before we get to Rob Williams' question, um, how did you get, I mean, did you do any uh, interviews with the Taliban or were you able to get the other side of the hill story? Only in a very limited way. And I think this is the biggest, well, I mean, I don't want to say what the biggest weakness of the book is. I'll let others judge that. But it's to, to me, this is the biggest weakness of the book um, is that I, I had, there's a very limited other side of the hill perspective. I was able to interview some men who admitted to having fought for the Taliban kind of at a low level and who would talk about their reasons for joining the Taliban. You know, there were Nuristani men who talked to me about, oh, well, my brother was killed or my cousin was killed and that's why I joined the Taliban. Um, but I wasn't able to talk to Taliban commanders, you know, kind of this, I mean, you know, the, the people that I really wanted to talk to would have been like shadow governors, dist shadow district governors, um, that kind of level of Taliban commander. Um, most of them are dead now, um, uh, th th those people. So I think their perspectives will never be known. Um, but there are some of them whose perspectives are captured in, uh, in limited fashion in interrogation reports among some of them who were, who were captured by the U.S. military. There's an Egyptian Al Qaeda operative whose interrogation reports I was able to draw on to a limited extent. Um, and then my hope is that, you know, again, you know, the book is done, the book is out, um, but I remain really interested in this, in this area and this uh, part of the war. Um, so, you know, my hope is that in years to come, you know, one silver lining of the catastrophe that has befallen Afghanistan this year um, may be that um, Taliban commanders who previously were not accessible to international journalists, 
uh, may become more willing to talk about uh, their stories. I mean, Abu Iklas, the Egyptian who I mentioned, for instance, um, he, he's out there somewhere. Um, you know, he was in an NDS prison uh, at Bagram uh, early, as of earlier this year, uh, and that NDS prison was emptied out by the Taliban the day before they took Kabul. Um, so, you know, probably many of those people will not talk to Americans. Uh, many of them will talk to Americans, but either uh, won't be honest about their experiences or they will just, you know, see, see the war in just such a different way that it, it may just be hard to even to talk about it. But I'm, I'm really eager to, to try to the extent that it's possible. And in fact, um, one of the other uh, people who was incarcerated at Bagram, who was released by the Taliban, uh, ended up being the suicide bomber that killed 13 U.S. service members as the sort of last act of the war from the U.S. perspective. So, um, well, uh, as we discussed uh, before the webinar began, you do a great service to the historical pr profession, even though you say you're a, a journalist. Uh, um, if you actually did do a book on the war from the Taliban side, I think it would be fascinating. Uh, okay, so let's get to the audience questions. This one is from Robert Williams, who was an airborne infantryman, uh, served multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, now one of my advisees. And um, he asks a two-part question, but they're really related. Uh, and I'm gonna take them in reverse order. And that's it. Is there a point of diminishing returns when the protection of the force becomes uh, so paramount uh, that you forget about building relationships with locals uh, and thus your counterinsurgency mission, you sort of become a self-licking ice cream cone where the mission becomes protection rather than outreach. And the second part, which I think is really linked to it, uh, you mentioned how the fielding of MRAPs, the uh, mobile uh, protected armored vehicles um, that we used uh, really beginning in 2008 uh, on onward, as uh, you've mentioned, that's sort of indicative of failed counterinsurgency in uh, in the area. So could you elaborate on that? So take them in any order you want. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks, Rob, for that for that great question. You know, we're we're getting a question from a guy who who fought up in this part of the country with two five hundred three infantry, a unit that was there at the peak of things in two thousand seven two thousand eight. Um, and I think Rob uh, was there for the point at which we started to see those diminishing returns. I think he's absolutely right um, that there was a point where protection of the force became um, really the be all end all for US forces. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question first by talking a little bit briefly about the Soviet experience in this part of the country. Um, you know, US forces often came, came away from their tours in Afghanistan with an impression uh, of the Soviets that was a bit of a caricature, an impression that they were these big lumbering uh, armored formations that were clunking around the country, getting sucked into valleys and slaughtered without any idea what they were doing. Uh, and there's some truth to that. I think that's uh, I think that accurately characterizes, although maybe to an exaggerated degree, um, some of what the Soviet what Soviet troops were doing in the early years in Afghanistan. And I can't speak to other parts of the country, but I can say that um, in reviewing Soviet documentation um, from the war, which I tried to weave into the book when I could, and in some conversations with Soviet veterans of the war, uh, you actually saw in Kunar, you saw the Soviets undergo a real evolution from this lumbering armored behemoth um, in their tracked vehicles and their, in their BTR, wheeled armored personnel carriers that you still see the husks of all over the place, um, to a much lighter, more flexible force by the mid 80s. You know, photographs by the mid 80s depict um, guys who look, they look more like Mac V. Sog in Vietnam than they look like kind of what we think of the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, they were doing small, small light patrols up into the mountains that would last many days. Um, they would go up into areas that U.S. forces really only ever ventured kind of in the early years. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, what's fascinating is that U.S. forces also underwent an evolution in the same area, but it was almost the opposite evolution. You know, you can look at photographs of U.S. Army Rangers and Green Berets who were up in the Pesh in 2003, 2004, and they look just like these Soviet Spetsnaz guys who were there in the mid 80s after the Soviets had undergone their kind of tactical evolution. Um, but that was short lived for the U.S. because IEDs showed up. Uh, and so over the course of um, especially starting in like 2006, 2007, there are more and more layers of um, physical barriers that are put between U.S. troops and the population. And there are more and more bureaucratic barriers that are put up 
um, between U.S. troops and doing their missions, basically. Um, so, you know, the MRAPs that Rob brings up is a is the perfect example of this. Uh, another one is the concrete blast barriers. Um, you, you, by 2010, you see physical evidence um, in the Pesh of uh, stuff that looks like it came out of Iraq. Now, it, it didn't actually. It's not like the same MRAPs and same concrete barriers were shifted over from Iraq to Afghanistan. Um, but in a lot of ways, you saw kind of a cookie cutter application of, well, look, the MRAPs saved a lot of lives in Iraq. They were really helpful in this kind of flat, especially the kind of flat rural terrain in Anbar and surrounding Baghdad, where U.S. troops were dealing with deep buried IEDs. Um, and I think it's indisputable that the fielding of MRAPs saved many, many, many American lives in Iraq. Uh, but in Afghanistan, they were fielded and they were not really used as, uh, okay, here's a tool for the company commander to use when he deems it appropriate. Now, the way it kind of trickled down from, from the Pentagon to the units in the field was um, as these are the vehicles now, you will take them when you leave the wire. Um, and in parts of Afghanistan, that was fine. Uh, but in Kunar and Nuristan, um, I mean, the roads are just so narrow um, <clears throat> that, you know, the, the risk that was offset of IEDs um, was in some ways more than made up for by the risk of rollovers from these MRAPs. Um, uh, for one thing, and then for another thing, by just how limited um, American movement becomes, and you can you can see this in you know there's the, the WikiLeaks dump of data that shows the the grid coordinates of firefights over the years. Uh, you can see there are kind of there are villages where you know U.S. troops used to go to them pretty routinely in 2005, 2006 when they were driving around in uh, you know in pickup trucks and ATVs. Um, 2007, 2008 when Rob was there. Um, those pickup trucks are no longer kosher. You know, the IED threat is too great. Now there's a mandate that you have to go everywhere in armored Humvees. Um, so there are villages that were accessible to pickup trucks but are not accessible to armored Humvees. And now the only way you get to them is in an air assault mission. And the air assault mission becomes its own kind of monster. It's like you can't get the helicopters unless it's for a big named operation. Um, you can't get, uh, you can't plan a named operation on the same planning cycle that uh, allows you to do small, you know, targeted raids against the enemy. Um, so these, these air assaults are not kind of a, a way to just sort of do routine visits to a place. Um, and then in 2008, starting in 2008, and then, you know, very much so by the time I first visited that part of the country in 2010, I mean, I saw this evolution happen even between my first visit to Eastern Afghanistan the previous year in 2010. Um, MRAPs become ubiquitous and required. Um, and uh, there are, you know, there are, in the same way that there were places pickup trucks could go, um, that Humvees couldn't go. There are a lot of places that Humvees could go that MRAPs couldn't go. Or if they could go, uh, they would go at great risk of breaking an axle um, or you know, falling off the side of a road, collapsing a road, collapsing a bridge. And, and you see this really, it does, um, it, limits, it limits what US troops are, are able to do. Um, <clears throat> one of the people who I, I think most credibly makes this observation, which is not only, it's, it's my own observation, but it's one that's echoed by a lot of people that I talked to for the book, is, you know, there was an army organization that the army has sadly now, is now in the process of disestablishing called the Asymmetric Warfare Group, um, which makes appearances throughout the book, because those were some of the, um, in, an, in an army that was constantly rotating units through and where there was little kind of connective thread of people who knew the area and would go back to it over and over again, the AWG guys, uh, a few of them in particular, kind of they were that connective thread. They would go back over and over again to the same to the same regions, and they would see the threat, the, the fight evolve. And there's one guy in particular, kind of a legendary AWG operator, um, uh, who was well known to a succession of American units that he would go and embed with and advise up there. Um, who described it to me as, um, you know, 2009, 2010. Uh, wh when you had the MRAPs, that's when you started seeing the blank stares and the cold stares. Um, from the population, when you're most engaging with them more and more from, you know, descending from these big armored vehicles that you have to cl literally climb down out of rather than simply opening the door the way you do a pickup truck or an MRAP. Um, it, creates a, it creates both a physical and a psychological distance between U.S. troops and the population. Um, well, fascinating. Uh, on a related note, I'm going to skip down uh, because there's a question from Ben Lyman, who's a uh, Air Force officer, and he'd like to know uh, if the U.S. Army suffered from organizational amnesia. In other words, you did, we didn't fight a 20-year war. We fought 21-year wars. Uh, was there a lack of continuity? Would we have been better off just to plant a unit there and rotate individuals through that, that location? 
Um, so I, I think the, the army definitely did suffer from that type of institutional amnesia in, in Afghanistan, um, just as it did in Vietnam, um, where kind of, you know, I mean, the, the solution that the officer proposes is kind of what was done in Vietnam, though, is the problem, you know, so that actually, uh, to, to be clear, I, I propose that not not Ben. Oh, so. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, this is something I talked a lot with with interview subjects was well, okay, so you have this problem of these units rotate through, um, they and then they never come back, you know, what could have been done differently? What was the solution to that? Um, and you know, the army, it's not the, it's not that the army was ignoring this problem or was ignorant of it, it recognized the problem. Um, but it, it, on the time scale that it was working on, there really just weren't good solutions. I mean, one solution that the army tried to apply was kind of belatedly was, okay, we'll try to send brigades back to the same place over and over again. So 3rd Brigade, 10th Mountain Division does a stint there in one year, and then it goes home for a couple of years, and then we'll try to send it back to the same place again. But it doesn't really work because kind of what the, what the military calls the battlefield geometry keeps changing. You know, maybe a place where you thought you needed a whole brigade one year, you don't think you need a whole brigade the next year. So you're not going to then send a brigade there, to a place. And there's different people in that brigade. And that's absolutely there. right. Uh, so an, uh, the Army is an eternally young organization. So the idea of, OK, we're going to send a brigade back. Well, there are some of the same people in that organization, NCOs in particular, maybe some, you know, there are platoon leaders who are now company commanders, but it's not the same battalion commanders. It's not the same privates. It's overall, it's not the same. It's not just sending the same people back um, in the same way that, you know, when you send a Green, Green Beret A team back, you may have a little more continuity. There are more members, you know, there's turnover there too, but they stay there for longer. Um, you know, one of the more interesting solutions that that I that I heard suggested at one point was, uh, you know, from from another officer in two five zero three was, well, what if you know, what if when units rotated home, uh, some of their senior leaders, say like the company commander of the outgoing unit, didn't rotate home? What if that outgoing company commander stayed and became the senior advisor to the A and A in the battle space and kind of like a um, kind of like a mentor to the company commit to the incoming company commander uh, and stays and you know is kind of some institutional knowledge or what if you know what if battalions rotated on a on a six month cycle but divisions and brigades rotated on a two year cycle or you know there were a lot you know I, i've heard interesting kind of um solutions like that um one thing i will say is um you know well, well i think well it's it's tempting to because this was such a problem i mean i think it's it, it's really objectively it's it's hard to deny that the army had this problem with institutional amnesia especially when you look at um things like the air assault problem where you know there's what, what i call the Wadapur pilgrimage there's this one there's this one side valley north of the Pesh called the Wadapur, where u.s troops never built a physical outpost inside the valley they just would do air assaults up there um and it becomes almost like this rite of passage for each successive unit um, to the extent that even after the U.S. has pulled out of the Pesh, um, the 25th Infantry Division, uh, when it when it when its Third Brigade takes responsibility for northeastern Afghanistan, uh, it still does air assaults back up into the same place. In fact, it does an even bigger air assault than the units before, just sort of trying to replicate the body counts um, that that the previous units had gotten. So I think when when you look at these you know these kind of repeated air assaults up into the same valleys, you know, achieving the same result over and over again. It's hard to deny that there was this institutional amnesia. Um, but, you know, what I think, and this would be a kind of a discouraging answer is, I think this and a lot of other problems that, you know, that I identify in the book are kind of small fry on the larger scale of what went wrong in Afghanistan. You know, it's like, I, I can imagine a situation where the army does something better about unit rotation or personnel rotation, but does it matter? Uh, when you're, you're, you know, in, in the absence of supporting a different type of Afghan government, an Afghan government with uh, that's structured in some different way than it was structured in December 2001. Um, you know, when you have these sort of big structural problems with the war, like uh, just the, the, the fact that the government is so heavily centralized and people feel so detached from it, or just the physical presence of Pakistan as a sanctuary um, uh, that, that, that the insurgency could draw on constantly. Um, that you know that's not to say that it's not worthwhile to you know to, to look at these the lessons of kind of the tactical lessons or or organizational lessons of you know could the army have you know managed personnel better um and i think there are there are real lessons there i mean i think a, a lot of what you see is that the army you know the the army prioritized the army over uh over the mission in afghanistan um uh, you, know, you, you see that with the kind of the rotation of units, right? I mean, you couldn't do, you couldn't send units there for three years and then expect them to come back and, you know, and function in the same way. 
um, or re, you know, it would be a, be a much bigger hassle to reconstitute units after you know three years in Kunar than after one year in Kunar, um, and it would create all kinds of you know worse problems. I mean, I think for the for the veterans and soldiers who fought up there, um, but um, I, in some sense, it's hard to blame the army. I mean, it, the, the the whole the, this is not the, the army was not the army was never told, okay, we're going to be in here for twenty years, figure out how to do it, right? Um, at every point along the way, it always felt like, oh, we're here for a couple more years, but we're on our way out. It, you know, the, the military has been perpetually, it's been told by a series of, of administrations um, that it's on its way out of Afghanistan over and over and over and over and over again at different points of the war, um, you know, going back to going back to at least to 2011. Well, let's, uh, let, before I get back to the audience questions, let's take those two big issues. One is the nature of the Afghan government and its lack of legitimacy. And the other is the sanctuary for the Taliban in uh, next door in Pakistan. Um, given those, one of which we might have been able to affect, the other one probably not, um, could we have won? Is, is this war winnable in any sense? And, it, and if not, at what point should we have pulled the plug? Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for could we have won um, other than I, I, winning being a stable Afghan government or stable enough that controls, let's say, the population centers yeah. of the country, and uh, and Afghanistan is not a base for uh, a terrorist group with international reach. Sure, um, I think you know the the second part of that, and not a base for a terrorist group with international reach, um, was probably a much more achievable goal than the first one. Um, you know, as we know, Al Qaeda was present all along in certain parts of Afghanistan. Um, but for many periods of the war, um, enough pressure was kind of applied to it um, that it was not it did not present a serious, uh, you know, international threat, um, you know, when it had JSOC running Operation Haymaker over its head all the time. Um, the first part, you know, a stable, a stable government, um, that's much harder. Um, and again, this is kind of this is outside the scope of what I've done the real the deep research on for this book. But um, it's it's hard for me to imagine um, a better outcome without one a government that was somehow more representative at a local level that did not have kind of uh, governors and district governors appointed by Kabul, um, and two um, that did not involve the Taliban in some way. Um, you know, starting with the point when they were at their lowest ebb in December two thousand one. Um, you know, when they were probably more willing to negotiate for better terms than they ever would be at any point in the subsequent two decades. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting point. It would have taken a lot of foresight uh, on the part of uh, politicians to engage them at that point. Right. Um, Alex Thompson asks, uh, and this is kind of along the same lines, had we not been diverted to Iraq, would that have made a difference? Yeah, this is a good question too, um, this, this counterfactual. I think there are two versions of this counterfactual. Um, there's one that's kind of, I think, has taken hold in a popular, popular media narrative that is, well, the United States took its eye off the ball in Afghanistan and went to Iraq. And if we had applied those resources instead to Afghanistan, things would have gone better somehow. Now, I don't think that's true if the resources we're talking about are large formations of conventional army troops. Because uh, one of the things that I describe in the book, and that's very aptly described in many other books and other accounts as well, is that, you know, really in 2003, there was not an insurgency in Afghanistan. Uh, there, were, there were pockets of uh, insurgent activity, but there was no broad-based insurgency. But it, in a lot of ways, U.S. military activity, uh, and, and we're talking here about the activity of small teams of special operators who are pretty good at what they do in the, in the, in the scheme of... Uh, you know, well-trained U.S. military units to less well-trained U.S. military units, just the, the presence and activity of those special operations teams going around acting like hammers looking for nails was enough to spark a more broad-based insurgency and to, to give the Taliban uh, an entry point, um, to let, to, you know, to give them an entry point, even in places like Kunar, where they had not had a strong presence before. So to imagine that, you know, putting a, a brigade of the 82nd Airborne in Kunar in 2003 would have had a better outcome uh, than putting those Green Beret teams there. I have a really hard time with that. I just don't buy it. Now, the other version, the other version that I, I think I nodded to a little bit earlier is, well, what if at a narrower level, the JSOC task force had not had to pull up roots the way it did in the fall of 2002 
to begin planning for its role in Iraq? And I think that's a much more, it's a more interesting question. Um, and it, it doesn't get at kind of, you know, the stability of Afghanistan, um, but it gets at the possibility of getting bin Laden earlier. And therefore, I think, you know, potentially giving the Bush administration the political capital to leave earlier. Because mm-hmm. I, I just, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where the Bush administration is able to leave Afghanistan or feels that it's able to leave Afghanistan without having captured or killed bin Laden. And the window for that is a very, it's a very small window, um, you know, in the fall of 2002 and uh, the winter of 2003 before he relocates over the border to Pakistan. And they came so close in this Shigal raid that I describe in chapter one of the book, closer than JSOC ever knew at the time, um, <clears throat> that, you know, you wonder, I mean, if, and it was right after that Shigal raid that the JSOC task force got stripped down to really an incredibly small force. I mean, you, you know, when you talk to JSOC guys who were in Afghanistan in, in you know, in 2003, when, uh, when the task force was super focused on Iraq, I mean, th- there was a point where there was a single special mission unit troop uh, uh, in country, a single one, uh, uh, diced out, you know, spread out to support CIA bases around the country and not even a second troop to do strikes, and which is kind of incredible. You know, years later, you had 22 JSOC strike forces in the country in 2011. But there was a point where there was just one and it wasn't even a strike force. So it, I think that's an interesting counterfactual to kind of play with is, well, was there a way, you know, if they had caught Kashmir Khan in that in that fall 2002 raid, or if they had done a follow up raid, if they hadn't if they hadn't been, you know, pulled up and said, OK, time to go plan uh, plan JSOC's role in the invasion of Iraq. Is there a way that the bin Laden manhunt ends in the fall of 2002 or early 2003? Maybe it's I think it's, it's conceivable. And that's yeah, that's the only scenario I can imagine where the Bush administration is able to, you know, feels able to to leave. So something you said there early on about hammers looking for nails. Uh, it sounds like you uh, subscribe to David Kilcullen's thesis in The Accidental Gorilla that going into these areas with military force actually begets more pushback from the locals. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think there's copious evidence of that in the Pesh. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give an example of um, in 2004, uh, the first Green Beret team to live in the Pesh um, has a civilian casualty incident. There's a, the Green Beret team is out on patrol and the team captain actually, um, uh, you know, a big, a, a big kind of uh, a, a wild dog comes at the captain. The captain shoots the wild dog, bullet goes through the dog, kills it, ricochets off a rock, kills a shopkeeper. Um, the Green Beret captain is horrified by what he's done accidentally. Um, and he's horrified at what he thinks the consequences might be. His name is Ronald Fry. And he actually, he's written an excellent memoir about his time in the patch called Hammerhead Six, which was his call sign. Um, but he was part of this 19th group National Guard team. Um, but he, he was afraid that the team was going to be kicked out of the valley. They'd have, to, they'd have to leave. People wouldn't want them there anymore. None of that happened. Uh, you know, he was able to, uh, he, he was able to, he had hit a good enough relationship with, um, you know, with the, the village elders and the district government, such as it was, um, and that he was able to kind of negotiate reparations um, and things were smoothed over and it did not ruin the, t- the, the town's, uh, you know, the town's relationship with the team. Um, over subsequent years, many, many, many other units go through similar situations. And in subsequent years, people are not as willing to forgive and forget. Because if you think about it from these U.S. units perspective, every unit has a learning curve. You know, you, you come into the country uh, your first few weeks are really dangerous for U.S. troops on the ground. Uh, the enemy's testing them. They don't really know what's going on in a lot of ways. They don't have their mountain legs under them. They don't just kind of have a feel for what normal life is like. Um, it's a dangerous time for U.S. troops. Um, but they gradually learn. And you, by later in their deployments, um, they, they, they have, you know, they're more careful and it's less prone to, you know, say, shooting up a, mach- uh, a truck that's coming at them a little too fast. Um, you know, from the Afghan perspective, this is cyclical. It happens over and over and over and over again. So no matter how well-intentioned these units are, if one unit after another keeps doing it, I mean, how much of you are you going to put up with? Right. Um, along the same lines in terms of unintended consequences, John Mueller asks a question about drone strikes and airstrikes. Uh, you note that killed leaders were quickly replaced, often by more violent and paranoid ones. Um, and that the strikes actually help Taliban recruitment on, you know, on the on the balance, um, how effective were these airstrikes and did they help more than they hurt or did they hurt more than they helped? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, so I think we have to draw a distinction between different types of airstrikes that happened over the years. Um, there were a lot of civilian deaths caused by airstrikes in Kunar, a lot of them. I mean, the, the incidents like that feature in almost every chapter of the book. And I could rattle them off from, you know, multiple ones every year along the way, of, you know, substantiated, documented um, strikes that, that killed civilians, um, including, you know, uh, often women and children, whole families. I mean, the, the terrain up there, the forests, it really it makes it really hard to, to know what you're doing to the extent where you just you're certain that you're not going to kill um, that there's people there you don't know about um, most of those. Most of the incidents that really went south and killed a lot of civilians um, were in uh, strikes that were hasty, strikes where there was some element of time pressure, um, especially strikes in support of troops in contact or strikes that were um, ordered to kind of uh, to, with with too great of haste um, to catch a, a fleeting target who they didn't think was going to be there the next night. Um, what you don't see, uh, you, you just so in Operation Haymaker, the, the JSOC drone campaign that begins in, in 2012, um, you don't see those kinds of civilian casualties to the same extent. You do see them. I mean, there's there's a particular incident in 2013 in Gambir in the Waterpur Valley um, that's just, a, I mean, just a horrific one um, where, where a whole family with multiple children are killed in a, uh, in, in a, in a JSOC drone strike up there. Um, but you see far fewer of them in this kind of the deliberate, the deliberate strikes um, that JSOC was doing at that point when it had all these surveillance resources. It could soak compounds for days and days and days or you know, months and months and months, really. Um, and it, could, it really had the luxury of waiting until, OK, a guy is out um, you know, relieving himself at an outhouse or in the forest or something um, to pull the trigger on the strike when they have just this 24-7 persistent surveillance on and on and on and on. Um, and that really it, it it lessens the number of civilian casualties to the extent that um, you know people that I interviewed from the town of Arantz in the Weigal Valley. I mean, one persistent observation that I heard was we had a lot of women and children killed in airstrikes earlier in the war. We didn't have women and children killed in airstrikes during the period of the drone campaign uh, after U.S. forces had left. But what they who they did have killed in airstrikes during that period um, that they're angry about was young men who were um, uh, affiliated with the Taliban. Uh, armed, you know, off, often armed. I mean, men who who were who were legitimate targets from a from a legal perspective, uh, but whose deaths really just drove people more and more into the arms of, of the insurgency. Um, there's a complicated um, dynamic here where you know the the point of Operation Haymaker was um, it was to keep a lid on a small number of Al Qaeda militants. If not to kill them, then to make it hard for them to exist and have support from local communities. So in some sense, I think what Operation Haymaker did um, is that even as it, it actually achieved that objective um, by pushing Al Qaeda out of the towns and the communities up into, into higher parts of the mountains because local Taliban commanders didn't want them around, communities didn't want them around because they drew in airstrikes. So it, 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 kind of, it isolated Al Qaeda, but at the same time, it increased, it increased local support for the Taliban. Um, so that's, it's like a pretty complex kind of nuanced effect there. Um, and I, you know, I, I, um, I, it's, it's, it's based on not, you know, not hundreds and hundreds of interviews with residents. It's based on the residents I was able to talk to. Um, but that's, that's kind of my impression of what Haymaker did is that it was effective at driving Al Qaeda deeper and deeper into the amount, into the mountains, but at great cost to the Afghan government. Um, and its support. So in some, that's a, it's an example of kind of where the, the counterterrorism mission is in conflict with the, the bigger stability mission rather than, you know, nested within it. All right. So earlier you mentioned sort of the body count mentality of one of those brigades at <laughs> the big air assault mission. Uh, Sean Liming, who's a um, eight tour, eight Afghanistan tour veteran uh, with third special forces group, uh, and now a history PhD student at Ohio State. Um, just want your take on the general body count mentality and, and the focus on capturing and killing high value targets um, versus, I guess, a broader counterinsurgency outlook, whether that would be focus on the population or, or some other metric. Sure. Great question. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily always, um, you know, KIA numbers that are counted. But there are 
you know, I mean, that's something that I saw particularly with these big conventional battalion air assaults up into the water pour in the Shuriak and these side valleys is they would produce a satisfying result. I mean, from a U.S. military perspective, there would be signals intelligence that would indicate afterward that, you know, at least 115 enemy were killed or something like that. Uh, at least 90 enemy killed, something like that. So that and that's so that's sort of the body count thing. But I think um, on the special operations side um, uh, that, uh, that that Sean was engaged in, um, I think the there was a real there was a real tension between um, you kind of you want to be able to count things and demonstrate that you're having effects. And some of the most easily countable and demonstrable kinds of things are night raids, right? The stuff that the JSOC task force is doing. The stuff that's much harder to quantify uh, and much harder to kind of prove that anything is being successful um, is um, stuff where the point isn't really to you know to kill a specific enemy leader or uh, you know or, or capture a specific enemy leader or, or destroy a specific enemy cell. I mean, you know, it may be that going out and doing a raid with an ANA an commando company against kind of a low hanging fruit target where the risk is very low and you're not actually going to get any 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 big target like a JSOC raid would in the same place, maybe that's more, more a bigger success because you have built the confidence of that Afghan National Army Commando Company um, to then be able to do something on its own. But how do you quantify, how do you show that kind of in the briefings? I mean, how do you show that this, this kind of more subtle thing that the Green Berets have done, um, uh, you know, how, how does that stack up against, well, Task Force East went in and killed 17 militants and got a jackpot and, um, you know, I think there's there's something really seductive about what the JSOC task force could provide um, as the years went on, um, especially in a war where, um, you know, for so much of the time, I mean, it, especially in other parts of Afghanistan, the south, where it was this IED fight rather than the artillery and artillery and mortars and guns of the, of the northeast. Um, so often it seemed like U.S. troops were on the defensive, suffering casualties rather than inflicting casualties. Um, that I think there really was something incredibly seductive about what JSOC had to offer um, uh, uh, in, in the way of just going out and just doing more and more night raids every year, um, even, even when they were no longer, you know, when they had introduced tactics that uh, where, you know, a high percentage of the raids didn't result in shots fired, they resulted in detainees. Um, it's still, you know, that's not a body count. It's not about counting violence, but it's, it's something that can be counted and demonstrates kind of that we're the, on the offensive and doing something. Um, so I think that's that's definitely something that, you know, succession of um, commanders at all levels kind of fell prey to um, was, yeah, just kind of putting putting more weight on that stuff because it was easier to understand it. And they couldn't stay. I mean, there was no hold aspect to these operations, just go in there and uh, whack people and, and then leave. Right. And so, so there's a story as old as these wars and probably much older is these raids, um, you know, you get these, you get the Rangers or SEALs, they come in, uh, sometimes they hit the wrong target and they kill innocent people. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's a subject that I think is really worthy of investigation and one that I'm, I'm involved in investigating for a future project. But on other occasions, you know, on the vast majority of occasions, even when they get the right people, um, it can still be a, a huge pain for the conventional force in the area to deal with um, if there are not if there's not sort of very careful, deliberate measures that are kind of against the nature of the JSOC task force to take um, to coordinate with the, 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 the infantry unit in the area, uh, make sure that they know ahead of time what's going on, uh, make sure that there's kind of a handoff um, that happens, you know, and, and the task force took reforms to ensure that all this stuff um, happened. Um, after years and years and years of, you know, in, in the early stages of the war of not working that way. Um, but it's, yeah, there's not, there's not a conventional unit that I talked to up there that didn't have horror stories about, um, you know, just people killed in the night with no explanation why. Yeah, I had the same when I was brigade commander. I'm sure. In Iraq and, and the JSOC came in one night, lost two of their own people mm -hmm. in an area that we could have warned them about, but no coordination at whatsoever. And the next day, the Iraqi uh, leaders are at my doorstep saying, what have you done? And right. I'm like, what happened? <laughs> and, and in some cases, it's as simple as if JSOC just told you what they had done, then you could tell the Iraqi leaders. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, well, let's move on. Um, Julian Larson has um, sort of a question about the other side, the Taliban. Uh, where did they obtain their supplies, their food, their, their weapons, um, their money? Uh, was it sort of a local insurgency or did they really depend on outside support? Um, that's a really good question. I think it was a, a, 
again, I'm looking. I'm, so my, my answer here is going to be um, specific to the area that I wrote the book about, Kunar and Nuristan. And that's limiting because um, the insurgency up there was pretty unique from uh, the, the, the broader Taliban insurgency in the Pashtun heartland. Um, you know, you had a lot of little, little Salafi groups, little local Salafi cells that were kind of co-opted by the Taliban um, uh, or, the, or that kind of allied themselves with the Taliban out of convenience, even though their ideologies didn't match uh, and that often later turned against the Taliban and joined the Islamic State. Um, so I think up in, up in Kunar, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that there was a very strong local insurgency um, where local notables, you know, there's a guy named uh, Haji Muhammad Dauran, who was a, uh, you know, wealthy kind of landowner in Sundre, a village in the Pesh Valley, who became a, um, a Salafi commander, who then eventually became a Taliban commander. But there were outside, but there were outside fighters too. Um, and, you know, the, what those outside fighters did and why they were there, um, you know, in a lot of ways was, um, you know, hard for me to pin down. Um, I think, probably very hard for, for the military to pin down as well, but there are probably are records that exist um, from detainee interrogations and sensitive site exploitation and so on that would shed more light on this than I was able to. Um, uh, but th there certainly was an outside presence that was interlocking with the, you know, with the, with the local, with the local insurgent presence. Um, figures like Abu Iqlas, um, you know, Egyptian Al Qaeda fighters would come in. They would provide, um, in some cases, weapons. In some cases, not weapons, but just expertise with weapons. Um, you know, weapons is one that I you could focus on for a second. I mean, um, I think the largest provider of weapons to the insurgency was the United States. Um, you know, if you, if you look at the Battle of Want in two thousand eight, um, that's that's an instance where after the battle happened, um, an ANA commando company with its Green Beret advisors uh, came in and. Um, raided the police station, um, and they found um, they found an extraordinary cache of uh, assault rifles of the specific model. It's a, it's a, like a Bulgarian make of the AK um, that has a distinctive kind of forward leaning hand grip rather than the the ones that you usually see, a, or a forward leaning under barrel hand grip. It's very distinctive looking. Uh, you see it with you see it supplied to the Afghan National Police because um, the U.S. had poured this specific model of AK into the Afghan National Police. And then those were the weapons that the Battle of Want was conducted with. Um, so I think, you know, Pakistan supplied many, many things to the Taliban. I think probably rifles was not the biggest one. Um, uh, let, me, let me just uh, chime in there. There's a great quote by a former inner services intelligence official. This is the Pakistani intelligence mm -hmm. agency who uh, was reflecting on, you know, for him, 40 years of war, the Soviets and then the Americans. And he said, I'm probably the only person in the world who can claim that I defeated the Soviets in Afghanistan with American money, and I defeated the Americans in Afghanistan with American money. <laughs> right. I think that's pretty spot on. Um, you know, there's a journalist, um, uh, Chris Shivers of the, of the New York Times, who he used to do, um, you know, he's a former Marine infantry officer, and something that he would do when he would embed with units in Afghanistan is he would kind of negotiate access to their captured weapons lockers um, and he would write down all the serial numbers and stuff like that and try to figure out where these weapons had come from uh, after the embeds. Um, and, you know, something that he found was that a lot of the weapons being captured were really old and had been in circulation for a long time. Either that or they were new ones that had been put into circulation by the U.S. effort to build and supply the Afghan National Security Forces. So we have 10 minutes left and I want to get to more recent events. So um... I just judge your answers accordingly. John Mueller says, in your book, you suggest Afghan military personnel were mostly illiterate, incapable of counting, unwilling to fight, only there for the money, on drugs, incapable of handling logistics, continually absent, deserting at well over 50% per year, and sometimes tipping off the Taliban. Otherwise, they were great soldiers. Um, <laughs> were you surprised by what happened with them this year? Um. I was surprised uh, it, to the extent that, um, you know, I, I can't claim that I foresaw the total collapse that, that happened in August. I mean, I, you know, just a couple of weeks before that, I was telling people, you know, when, when they would ask, oh, no, I don't think Kabul will fall this year. I think that's, you know, that's a year or two in the future. You know, maybe we'll see some cities start to fall. Um, but I think it's because, you know, the collapse that happened was a collapse. It was not a battlefield collapse in many ways. It was a, um, you know, it was a collapse by accommodation. Um, I think by there were, there were many, many deals made kind of under the surface in the months since the Doha agreement 
um, that the Taliban cashed in all at once this summer is kind of, I think is my suspicion and is borne out by some of the reporting so far, um, where once it, once it was, once everyone knew that the United States was on its way out, the Taliban didn't have to immediately take advantage of every, um, you know, every possibility that that opened up as they appeared. It could, it could, it could amass them. It could, um, you know, work out deals with district governors such that it then cashed them all in at once six months later when it needed to. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the description of the of the Afghan security forces. I mean, that sounds pretty harsh. Um, I, I I stand by it, um, but with the caveat that I mean, you're you're, you're talking about um, guys who are out there on hardship tours of a kind that U.S. forces can't imagine. Um, they're out there with no end date. They're often not being paid, um, uh, which you know, which leads to corruption, which leads to uh, all kinds of abuses. Um, and they're also, and this I think is a dynamic that needs to be studied further. Um, the bigger Afghan security forces are constantly being stripped of their best people um, uh, to, to, to man kind of other more elite organizations. Um, because at the same time that you've got this conventional train and equip mission that's building the Afghan National Army, um, you've also got the Green Berets are recruiting the ANA commandos from that pool. So anybody who's you know motivated and really wants to be fighting for their country um, uh, and has the opportunity to do so is going to want to don that red beret and join the commandos if they've spent some time in a conventional army unit and seen what it's like there. Um, and then you've also got, I mean, in many provinces, you have the CIA's counterterrorism pursuit teams. The CIA's surrogate forces are, are drawing away um, good manpower, drawing away people who want to be in these forces away from the Afghan National Army. Uh, and then, you know, besides the ANA commandos, which grew to be a very, very large force, I mean, there's other tiers above that that are sucking the talent upward away from the commandos. You've got the Katehas um, Special Forces Unit. You've got the Interior Ministry Triple Units. Um, so I think there was this kind of endless vacuum of talent away from the just the regular line ANA um, as the Special Operations Forces grew and grew and grew and became the offensive arm of the, you know, of, of the security forces um, that really made them extreme, contributed to their being as hollow as they turned out to have been. So, Going forward, the Bush, the um, uh, Biden administration has said, well, we're going to practice over the horizon counterterrorism. Is that going to work? I mean, you're, you're looking at drones now that have to be launched from bases in the Gulf, limited time on station. Uh, we've lost our, our human intelligence on site. Uh, right. you, you can just take it from there. But uh, what's the future of counterterrorism, American counterterrorism? In right. The so, you know, the methodology that JSOC got really good at during the past 20 years, they, they used to call it, um, I, I may botch the acronym, but F3EA, Find, Fix, Finish, Exploit, Analyze. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's what uh, under General McChrystal's tenure in, in Iraq, they kind of pioneered as they were going out and doing constant night raids, bringing in detainees, bringing in pocket litter and hard drives and so on. And now, sometimes turn a new mission that same night. Sometimes turn a new mission that same night, and they're bringing. And importantly, they're bringing in detainees and sensitive site exploitation stuff. Um, by the time you get to Operation Haymaker, JSOC's drone campaign um, up up in Kunar and Nuristan, really it's much more find, fix, finish, and a lot less exploit, analyze. Because when you're doing these drone strikes, um, there's no, you know, you're not you're not getting any detainees to interrogate. Uh, you're not getting any any hard drives to go through afterward. You're just you're just finishing the target. Uh, and so what JSOC kind of did over the years of in Operation Haymaker was it's, it killed its way through um, its intelligence leads. Um, now, the, the, the finish part is something that the U.S. military is still going to be able to do. Um, there are all, kind, all kinds of long, long range ordinance that the military can bring to bear, you know, as it did during the Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi raid um, in, in Syria two falls ago. Um, it can it can still put you know a limited number of uh you know of, of, of Reaper combat drone orbits up over Afghanistan. It can still put fighter aircraft up over Afghanistan. Again, much smaller numbers. What it, what refuelings and route right. So you know again you can do it for the you can do that for the finish, but the find and the fix is the part where it requires much much greater resources than oh we need a fighter jet at a specific place at a specific time. No. Well, the one the one element in Afghanistan that could give us that intelligence is the Taliban. And there's a question here about whether you have a prediction on the current Taliban versus I ISIS-K conflict. But really, the question is, should we ally with the Taliban against ISIS-K? Yeah, I mean, that's a really hard one. I think in some ways, um, 
you know, if, if the Taliban is willing to give intelligence to the United States to facilitate drone strikes or something against ISIS-K, I mean, sure, take in the intelligence. But if there's one lesson from all these years of counterterrorism in Afghanistan, um, it's that if you're not there on the ground and have a really good feel for the situation, you're going to get played by people giving you intelligence. Um, and so, you know, the, Tal the Taliban right now um, has every reason in the world um, to make it appear um, that it's going hard against ISIS-K. Um, it also has every reason in the world to brand various groups that are not ISIS-K as ISIS-K uh, in order to justify killings of various types. You know, we saw, as I, as I kind of document in various examples throughout the book, most notably the, the 2003 Iran's airstrike that kills this big family when the CIA gets played by two of its sources, um, it, it's, it's really hard in that environment not to get uh, used uh, and, and not, not to, and so, you know, I think probably the U.S. government is at, at, at a lesser risk of um, uh, becoming complacent and trusting of the Taliban than it, uh, than it was of becoming complacent and trusting of the National Directorate of Security. Um, but I mean, I think that's, that's the huge risk there is if you're not, if you're not able to vet this stuff, who are, who are you killing? Um, two more questions, and we're going to need really brief answers. Uh, one question on, you know, the feelings of the people you interviewed uh, in the U.S. Army as to how large a force it would take to control either the provinces you looked at or Afghanistan as a whole. Uh, the, the sort of ratios we had in Iraq would suggest 600,000 minimum. Um, or the answer might be you could put a million troops in there and you still can't control it. And yeah, I mean, I think if the numbers we're talking about are heavily weighted toward international forces rather than host nation forces, I, I think the answer is you, that the more of them you pour in there, the worse it gets. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's pr probably a different answer if you're talking about, um, you know, well-trained government forces. Uh, uh, and there's a different answer, you know, there are two different answers if you're talking about government forces that are predatory and prey on the population and steal things and, and are abusive uh, versus government forces that don't do those things and are representative of a, a government that people believe in. Um, you know, maybe there is some magic number of, you know, highly professionalized uh, Afghan security forces that, you know, that can, that can provide stability. And, and in the past, I mean, there was a period, you know, post, um, post 2013, when the place was pretty calm and peaceful, um, because the ANA had flooded the zone. They poured a, a lot more troops than U.S. advisors thought was reasonable or, 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 or wise, um, up into that area, um, with pretty good results. Right. So it comes back to the legitimacy of the government and the legitimacy of its security forces, which uh, were problematic in both cases. All right, final question. Uh, as a journalist, this is from Thomas Henderson. As a journalist, do you ever feel that your life was in danger? Um, sure, yes. I mean, I, I've been, um, uh, I, I did things when I was in my, you know, early and mid twenties that I probably wouldn't do today. Um, you, you know, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time sharing some of the risks of American infantrymen. I mean, I've, I've seen American and British infantrymen killed, you know, uh, very close at hand. Um, and, I, and I'll remember those guys forever. I mean, I, I have a, a bracelet up here that shows the names of the uh, Americans and Brits whose, whose deaths I was, I was present for. Um, uh, and then certainly, I mean, I, you know, when I, when I embedded with the ANA and Kunar, um, that was scary. I mean, I've, I've lived through a green on blue attack in Mosul before where Americans were killed around me. Um, so I was under no illusions about kind of the, the risks that I was undertaking by going and embedding with the ANA, but it was fine. I mean, I think there was no, um, you know, was, was my life ever in danger during that embed? Probably not. Um, but you know, there was, I was certainly scared during all of it. Well, we appreciate uh, your efforts at bringing the story to us. Wes, it was great having you here at the virtual Mershon Center for International Security Studies. Um, and don't be a stranger. We hope to have you back once you write that book on the Taliban side <laughs> of the... <laughs> uh, Kelly, if, we, <laughs> if you could I mean, put it's... up the slide on future events, please. <laughs> um, and while she's doing that, Wes, what's in your near future here? What's the next uh, project? Um, the next project I'm working on is a, um, is a magazine article that kind of spins off of some of the things uh, that we were talking about a little earlier about, you know, what happens when night raids go wrong um, or, or what happens even when from the special operations forces perspective, they go right but from the ground forces perspective, the conventional forces perspective, they go wrong. 
Um, so that, that's the that's about as far out as I'm looking. I mean, there's I still have um, you know the paperback of this book is coming out uh, this coming year in March. I just finished the you know the the paperback revisions for it, which were pretty pretty minimal. Um, I haven't thought that much farther ahead than that, honestly. Okay. Well, Wes, thank you again for your time. Um, on behalf of the uh, American Foreign and Military Policy Cluster at the Marshawn Center, thank you all for attending and please uh, sign up for these great events uh, that are coming uh, this month and next.